Israel is right now in stage two of the conflict. The stage three of the conflict is having a regime which has been de-Hamasified in Gaza. So Hamas will try and try and get more players sucked in, whether it is Iran, whether it is Qatar, whether it is Syria, whether it is Iraq, whether it is Lebanon, whether it is Hezbollah. So state and non-state actors, it wants to draw into the conflict to save its own skin. Israel has no options but to go for a long war, as uh, their Prime Minister Netanyahu has said. But the democratic world is, is not really, really interested in a long war because it has other ramifications. The global community, particularly the West, India, and, and other important players in the game, they are very much afraid that this may be a long, prolonged war. But this is not in the interest of the global community. If Middle East powers like Iran, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, if they start to uh, you know, put more pressure, then the oil prices are going to jack up, which is going to have a global ramification on that. India is very clear. It is with the Palestinian people. It is against terrorism. So India will continue to play this uh, uh, dual policy. We, we cannot afford to have an escalation because with escalation, there will be radicalization, which is going to come parallelly within the country and all over the world. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, people thought it would be over in a matter of weeks. But two years later, almost two years later, we are still here where we are. The war is still raging. The attention of the world, however, has shifted to another war, this time playing out in the Middle East. Here, a new war between Israel and Hamas. And that war threatens to draw in more global powers than the Russia-Ukraine war did. I am Aditi Prasad. You're watching Hindustan Times Point Plank with HT Executive Editor Shishir Gupta. Shishir, I'm going to come to you straight. Will this be yet another long war that the world can ill afford? See, currently uh, uh, we are in sort of a bit of a conundrum because... Uh, there are various players in the game who have different objectives. First of all, there is Israel. Israel has suffered one of the most brutal terrorist attacks ever known. Brutal, barbaric, medieval in nature, which involves children, women, men, and they have been butchered out. For Israel, it is imperative that it destroys Hamas, the terrorist group. Until, unless it does not destroy Hamas, Israel will always be under threat from Hamas sitting in Gaza. Israel is right now in stage two of the conflict. The stage three of the conflict is having a regime which has been de-Hamasified in Gaza. Then you have Hamas, the terrorist group. What Hamas is doing is that it is trying to project as if it is a religious war. It's a war against Islam, which it is not. It is a war against terrorism. But Hamas wants to draw in the entire Islamic world and beyond. That is the left liberals, the Democrats of US and everybody to say that it is a war against Islam. So Hamas will try and try and get more players sucked in, whether it is Iran, whether it is Qatar, whether it is Syria, whether it is Iraq, whether it is Lebanon, whether it is Hezbollah. So state and non-state actors, it wants to draw into the conflict to save its own skin. Then there is a larger world, a democratic world, a democratic world which has US, India, we have, which has other countries, which essentially are saying, that this terror attack has to be retaliated to 
but the humanitarian part or the Palestinian people need to be saved. That is the third part of it. Now, in all this uh, huge catch-22 situation is building up because Israel cannot get out of uh, Gaza till such time Hamas is eliminated. But Hamas will ensure that there will be collateral damage of Palestinian people and you will see images coming out. That will draw in other Middle East players and the configuration will spread. So basically you are saying it is going to be a long war? It is. Uh, it is uh, Israel has no options but to go for a long war as uh, their Prime Minister Netanyahu has said. But the democratic world is, is not really, really interested in a long war because it has other ramifications. For instance, if, a, will, if there is a long war... Those, I will, sir, I'll come to those ramifications in just a bit. But I want to talk to you about what the Israeli, what you said, and, and, and it reminded me of what the Israeli defense minister said. He said that this is the second phase of the war this weekend, the ground invasion of Gaza. He said this is the second phase of the war and may last many months. He also warned that it may just not be enough to uproot Hamas from Gaza, this second phase of war, this ground invasion. They will not be able to uproot Gaza, uh, Hamas from Gaza completely, hinting at more phases of the war, maybe a more long drawn uh, war. See, uh, whatever the Israeli defense minister may say, the global community, particularly the West, India, and, and other important players in the game, they are very much afraid that this may be a long, prolonged war. But this is not in the interest of the global community because what is going to happen is that it is going to draw in, suck in, suck in other Middle East players and create not a war of Israel versus Hamas, but a bigger Middle East war where other players will join in. Iran is already threatening. Hezbollah is already launch attacks. Syria is already launch attacks. And you never know what bigger players can come into the picture considering that the Hamas leadership like Ismail Haniya is based in Qatar. You have a former Hamas leader, Khalid Mashal, who's going around giving speeches, including in Kerala, to radicalize people and conjure up of an image that the entire Islamic world is being threatened by Israel rather than a group which has conducted barbaric attacks against innocents and non-combatants in South Israel. So you started talking about the ramifications of this war earlier and I am sorry I cut you short but if this turns out to be a long war which it's seems to have the makings uh, of, of one. What are the ramifications for the world? We are already reeling under the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war in terms of food prices, inflation, uh, oil prices. Um, uh, what happens with um, another, you know, and I'm not talking about India, I'm talking about the world. What are the ramifications of a long drawn war in the Middle East? You see, first of all, uh, the ram ramifications as far as U.S. is concerned, already we are hearing signs within the Democratic Party. Uh, the left liberals or the so-called woke community has already started putting pressure on President Joe Biden, where it, it is raising up this huge humanitarian disaster in, in Gaza. Then there are other players who are operating on the European powers to say that uh, humanitarian uh, disaster is happening against the Palestinian people. And if you look at uh, even France, where President Macron was totally out and out, supporting a anti-ISIS kind of alliance against Hamas, he voted in favor of the resolution on humanitarian aid. So what is going to happen is that if this war prolongs, it is going to have far more serious impact. First of all, the oil prices. If Middle East powers like Iran 
कतर यू ए सऊदी अरेबिया टर्की इफ दे स्टार्ट टू यू नो पुट मोर प्रेशर देन दी ऑयल प्राइसेस आर गोइंग टू जैक अप विच इज गोइंग टू हैव अ ग्लोबल रामिफिकेशन ऑन दैट सेकेंड थिंग इज इन केस Iran or anybody starts to uh, you know use weapons missiles to fire against Israel then the war will open up and then what you will see is you will not only see a uh, humanitarian disaster you will also see a whole lot of collateral damage happening third thing is you know the diaspora the american diaspora the indian diaspora the european diaspora which is sort of living in UAE Dubai in all these places Muscat Oman everywhere they'll be under threat so they will start to move back to their uh, country of origin so it is going to be a huge humanitarian disaster but all this you know uh, this uh, this is all also being created to tell israel to listen keep the operation short incisive limited to hamas and close down fast but i don't think so that is going to be the case let's let's talk also about the impact on india what are the ramifications of for india i mean yes it's a global world and you talked about oil prices and you talked about the humanitarian crisis and the expats uh, indian expats who are in dubai uae muscat toman uh, but other than that in terms of indian um indian foreign policy what are the ramifications of that if this if this war continues for a longer time you see the, uh, as far as india is concerned and uh, it is very clear that india has made its points very clear it is against terrorism point 1 but it is also for the palestinian people i make it very very clear hamas is not palestinian people hamas is a terrorist group india is very clear it is with the palestinian people it is against terrorism so india will continue to play this uh, uh, dual policy where it is sort of you know for a two state solution but at the same time it wants to take uh, take action against terrorism now when it comes to in what happens to india and what happens to indian foreign policy is india is already engaging other players in the middle east to ensure that the humanitarian aid goes through for instance prime minister modi has already had a conversation with the uh, egyptian president uh, 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 prime uh, prime minister modi has already been talking to other players in the game and if, what is happening is that external affairs jay shankar is already talking to players like you know oman already talking to uae and other players so that you know the there is a voice of moderation that prevails in the region and that is why which is the most important thing that is needed right now we we cannot afford to have a escalation because with escalation there'll be radicalization which is going to come parallelly within the country and all over the world this religious radicalization is something which we should fear the most because this is what creates small pockets or small modules of extremist who who go on to take unilateral actions stand alone attacks lone wolf attacks and that is what the biggest threat is you know uh, it's a very scary uh, picture you're painting there shishir but uh, even if hamas is obliterated even if obliterated and and israel is able to achieve its stated goal then what peace in the middle east is not going to be a guarantee even then because uh, hamas is not just going to be obliterated you know removed from the scene i mean they they can they can kill kill all of them today and tomorrow a new crop will be ready you see uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, it's very simplistic to say that first of all can hamas be obliterated the answer is no because the leadership of hamas is not living in gaza they are living in qatar right. they are living in other places they are, they are they are talking to iran so hamas cannot be obliterated but but the message to hamas and to terrorists must be sent otherwise what will happen is that the terrorist groups will get a huge impetus if if uh, hamas is not taken on and you will see other attacks happening 
For instance, when Taliban took over Kabul on August 15, 2021, this was a message to the global uh, terrorist community that, listen, you can actually take on state players. If Hamas is not obliterated, the message will be very clear that there is a threat to the Israeli nation, to the Jew community. And tomorrow this can happen anywhere in the world. It can happen in Maldives. It can happen in Pakistan. It can happen in Bangladesh. And that is the biggest worry. All right, Jesha. Thank you so much for your for your inputs and your views and your analysis of the situation in the Middle East. We sure hope that this will not be a long drawn out war, but all signs are that it just might be and the world needs to be ready for that. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you viewers for watching this broadcast. Stay tuned to Hindustan Times Point Blank. Yeah!